Hey, everybody. Welcome to Big Blend Radio's fourth Wednesday Tucson Sisters in Crime show. Uh, the Tucson Sisters in Crime is a local, well, it's obviously it's a local Tucson, Arizona chapter of the international organization called Sisters in Crime. And they're made up of authors, writers, readers, librarians, editors, publishers, agents, booksellers, all with a passion for the mystery genre. And they welcome sisters and brothers in crime because you can't just have sisters doing it all by themselves, you know. <laughs> so you got sisters and brothers in crime are welcome from everyone who have an interest in writing and also in the Southern Arizona mystery community. So I encourage you to go to the website. It is TucsonSistersInCrime.org. And I know uh, this past uh, you know couple years with COVID, they haven't been able to do the uh, Arizona Books uh, Festival. That is a big deal that happens in Tucson every spring. I think it's every February, March. Uh oh, I'll, I'll get that straight in a second. But I believe it's coming up for 2022. So you want to definitely keep up with Tucson Sisters in Crime.org because I always have a booth at this wonderful festival. But today we're excited because we get to welcome writer and author Kate Thornton. And you can go to her website, katethornton.net. So Kate, welcome. How are you? Thank you. I'm fine. Thank you. Good. Hey, it's good to have you on the show here and, you know, talking about sisters in crime. Apparently, you've been a sister in crime in L.A. and in Tucson and on the boards of both of both organizations. That's true. I've been a member of Sisters in Crime since the mid 90s. Oh, wow. I, was, I was on the board in Los Angeles. In fact, I believe um, Sarah Paretsky was one of our founding members and I uh, I believe she may have signed me up at a book signing See, for Sisters really? in Crime Los Angeles. So oh, wow. Wow. Sisters in Crime LA has all the screenwriters and a lot of the famous writers, but Sisters in Crime Tucson has a lot of the really interesting writers as well. We found mm. out on these uh, shows that we've been doing this year, um, it's been really interesting. I mean, there's writers who are doing like geology mysteries, and then there's viruses and all kinds of things there's you know everyone's doing something completely unique and different and as we say the desert is always a good place to bury a body so. that's true <laughs> one of our writers is actually writing a mystery um based on lizards so i'm not sure how that's going right now but wow that should be really fascinating see there's always something <laughs> interesting out there and tucson yeah i mean you've got a lot of great authors that come out of tucson too it's also got a huge movie community so it's a creative place for sure so and you've got all the public art you've got great musicians so tucson we we miss tucson don't we nancy yeah it's a great place in fact and and it's, it is a good place to have a murder mystery oh mm -hmm. yeah yeah. And the food. Don't forget the food. That's right. Oh, yeah. You're the gastronomy capital, the UNESCO gastronomy capital of the world. So, you know, that's a, yeah. We, it explains why I'm no longer slim. That, <laughs> we're not Always. either. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, it's a fun thing to eat. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> So let's let's talk a little bit about your writing, because I was reading on your website again, everyone, katethornton.net, um, that you've written over 100 short stories. Is that where your writing started, is writing short stories? Yes, yes. The very first short story that I attempted, um, someone had done something really nasty to me and had gotten away with it. And I was determined that they should not get away with it completely. So I started writing a story. And I had not written stories before. This was in the early 90s. And I started writing a story that involved um, murder. And I wanted to just balance the justice aspect of the universe, one murder at a time, starting with this one. <laughs> so if somebody so I knew, I knew to I knew you I in the market, really you're going to kill them later. <laughs> right. No, I knew I, I knew I couldn't actually kill someone, but you, uh, no oh, matter how much I wanted to. Wow, but, that's fun therapy. I could certainly like rewrite history. So I started researching it. That's and by the time I got the story written, it had nothing to do with that person and nothing to do with that particular incident. It was a completely different story. And I realized what it was like 
to write a story and how much went into it. Um, three quarters of the meticulous research I, I did on murder weapons, I didn't use, at least in that story. Yeah, you use it later. I think no research oh, goes wow. to waste. I think you, you never know, you know? It's interesting That's also it. your background of being in the US Army. What a, a veteran you've been, you worked in the Army for over 22 years, right? And in intelligence, you're scaring me. Yeah. <laughs> the intelligence yeah. word, I'm like, I didn't do it, ma'am. <laughs> I didn't do it. But- oh, um, man, so you could come out like a, murder, a murderer in a tank. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the only time I was ever in a tank was just uh, because I thought the tanker was a cute guy. Oh, but I don't know. <laughs> what I did was counterintelligence. I was a counterintelligence agent for many years. And so most of what I did was talk to people and write reports. Oh. And all the rest of what I did, um, I really can't talk about. Come Here's on. Why. You're a spy, <laughs> but but I did it in several languages. So <laughs> wow, that was spy in different languages. That's cool. <laughs> so so this is interesting. So you did it in several languages, and you but this is interesting doing counterintelligence and then you can't really talk about it but there's research in that and talking to people getting you know the information. Mm. So that's really got to help you in your writing now. Those were basic skills that every writer needs. Uh, I just happened to acquire them in an interesting way. Wow. So when you were in the military, were you traveling around the country? I, I don't know if you're allowed to tell us this, but, you know, were you in this country <laughs> around the world since you had different languages? Come on, I want to know everything now. <laughs> My father was a naval officer, a career naval officer, and we traveled the world when I was a child. So mm -hmm. when I got old enough to do some traveling of my own, I realized how expensive it is if you're not traveling for work. Mm. And so, yes, the army allowed me to do some good traveling so as well as some traveling that wasn't quite so hot. Yeah, I'll bet. yeah I, I can understand <laughs> that part of it. And when you're in the counterintelligence for the, for the military, uh, whether it's army, navy, you know, are, do people like civilians know that you're in counterintelligence or is that hush hush too? It depends on what your mission is and where you are. Oh, um, so that I so it wouldn't go yeah. by the entire. Yeah, I'm. This is fascinating to me. <laughs> I know. <laughs> is this would this go for your Pretty entire cool. career, or it just depends on your mission each time? Depends on your mission each time. Oh yeah. wow. wow, wow. So what so about in the military? Know. Would the military know? Uh, yeah, yeah. What the, in the kind of job I had? Yes, yes, they knew. I was in a whole unit of other people who were in also in intelligence specialties. Wow. Wow. So, so yeah. together. This is so really interesting. I can see why you end up writing mysteries. That's way cool. I, I think that when you're writing a mystery, all you're really doing is telling the truth mm -hmm. in an interesting way. Yeah. yeah. Oh. And again, balancing the order of the universe. Mm -hmm murder at a time so <laughs> are you gonna run for office <laughs> <laughs> no, no I, if I don't like you i'm just gonna take you out yeah <laughs> that's, that's that's funny that's funny kate um one thing i wanted to ask now you've got two different series you've got the tony carey mysteries and then the kitty and coco mysteries so give us an oh who's tony Tell us a little bit about Tony, and then let's talk about Kitty and Coco. And Tony is my magazine writer who lived in Los Angeles for a long time, um, unhappily. And her dear Uncle Horace lived out in the Eastern Valley area, the San Gabriel Valley. Mm -hmm. So when Uncle Horace is attacked, Tony goes out to help him and find out what's going on because she spent much of her childhood with her dear uncle, who was a beekeeper. Um, Tony is kind of a smart aleck. She's very intelligent. She's been married and divorced. She uh, certainly appreciates men and uh, has no qualms about letting herself and them know about it. And uh, 
and she adores her uncle. Her mother and her sisters were the bane of her childhood, and they live in Los Angeles. So Tony uh, goes out to this wonderful little town, the fictional town of Loma Vista, which was an old citrus town. They have a university and a think tank and a main street with some Victorian mansions and a nice little town square. And the whole mystery takes place there. And Buzzkill, the first book, revolves around what happens to her uncle and his beehives. And the second book in the series, Medium Dead, Tony has decided to live in the town of Loma Vista. She moves out there and becomes involved with one of the researchers at the think tank there. Ooh, 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 ooh the oh. think tank. Okay, so right. this is interesting. You go the bees and then a mediums. That could get interesting. It does. There's a, there's a medium in Loma Vista who is not preying on older women, but actually giving them their money's worth. And uh, Tony wants to know, is it for real? We want to know, is it for real? I think we all want to know. Even the dogs want to know. The dogs want to know if it's for real. I love that. It's so funny. Whenever we start doing a podcast, all the animals come out and play. Yeah, they're like, what's going on? We've got cats over here hanging out with us. It's so funny. But, you know, so this, what, what led you to write and set it in Southern California, the series? Well, I, I set it in a mythic town that was very much like the town I went to high school in, in Southern okay. California. I went to high school in Upland. Okay. And this town, this town is very much like the surrounding citrus towns. Um, mm -hmm. Many of them are gone now. They've been, um, they've been developed and they've been uh, incorporated into each other. Um, the old towns of, of, Cucamonga, for example, that's now Rancho Cucamonga and, mm -hmm. and is a thriving little metropolis. But the old towns of my high school days were interesting. Mm -hmm. And there are a few of them still left that have that old main street and have that old railway spur that they used to pack the lemons into uh, the trains from. Those beautiful depots like Riverside, you mm -hmm. know, and, yes. and yes. all those areas. We, we used to live out in Southern California. We're both from mm -hmm. there originally, but ended up moving to Tucson and now we're on the road full time. But uh, Tucson has got to be interesting. Do you get Tucson in any of your books at all? I haven't. Well, I haven't yet and mm -hmm. probably will not for the Tony Carey mysteries because they're set in Loma Vista yeah. and it's part of their, their charm is that charming town. But the Kitty and Coco books are completely different. Kitty Morse is getting out of a bad engagement. She was engaged to a really controlling and awful guy. And she sort of got out of that on a vacation to upstate New York. The Kitty is a little older and Kitty has been told for many years that she's not attractive and nobody else would Ooh. want her. And, and so her self-esteem is pretty low until we get to this book, Kitty Takes a Chance, in which the chance that she takes is breaking the engagement and becoming involved with a little dog that she finds and an investigator that she also finds and a couple of murders that happen. And Ooh. in the meantime, she she falls in love with the little dog and the investigator. Um, <laughs> but at the end, there's a bittersweet ending. The, the little dog has to go back to his real owner, which is really a happy ending. When you read the book, you'll, you'll see it's a happy ending. <laughs> uh, and the investigator falls in love with her, but she's not quite sure yet. So we we leave them on a note of, Kitty still has some growing to do and some, some finding mm. of herself. Mm. But That's... in the second book, which I hope to have out by Christmas, which is Kitty Takes a Detour, her detour leads her to Tucson and then on to New Mexico. Oh, cool. Because she's mm. searching for her missing brother. And her missing brother, Jimmy, is one of those oft married guys. And I was originally going to call it Seven Brides for One Brother. Oh. <laughs> but, um, but Jimmy got married again, so uh, he spoiled my title. I couldn't <laughs> wait. How dare he? 
Does that happen like when you're writing that things just change? You have this idea and then the characters go like, no, this is what's happening instead. Yes, that's what happens when they when they come alive. Um, that's the price you pay as a writer to have living characters who say, no, we're not going to do that. Um, or no, I don't like him. I like the other guy. Or uh, what do you mean? That's the clue. That's not the clue. This is. So when you build a character, are they bits and pieces of people that you have seen and have known? Or are they like, this is totally Uncle Ned or whoever, and you're just going to camouflage it a bit? I think mine are, always, mine are always bits and pieces. Hmm, I, okay. I seldom base anyone on a, a complete whole person um, because I'm afraid I can't be very um, complimentary to them. <laughs> so, uh, and my friends would recognize themselves, I'm afraid. So oh, nice. I, I do bits and pieces. I want them to be a completely believable new person. Mm -hmm. But that means I have to uh, gather those bits and pieces. And one of the ways I do that is to eavesdrop on real people. And uh, oh, that's okay. Cool. Wait, okay. I yeah. want some good skills on eavesdropping. Yeah. Like, okay. So <laughs> do you do this in public, you know, or? You know, when you're at a party, do you kind of lean over and kind of hear what they're talking about and decide, okay, this is what's really going on? Well, I haven't been to a party in years. Yeah. But I do go to food courts and sit where I can hear people talk. And one of my favorite ways of eavesdropping on people is to go to a public place where people think that anything they say is perfectly private. The other excellent way to eavesdrop is when they're on the phone. Mm, People yeah. say anything now. and loudly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Shut them up. Totally true. No, they walk around with their speaker open. Yeah, you know? totally true. And you can hear all kinds of things. It's really yeah. quite fascinating. You yeah, know? I, have, I have followed people in the supermarket. Uh -oh. My cart. I just follow them listening. I pretend to take things off the shelf, but, but uh, you know, I'm just really in there to to listen to their lives. I want to go hang out with you for a day. Yeah, that sounds like we, we were sitting in Vegas once and um, pretended to be British. And it was <laughs> great fun. That was great fun. And people would, some, that one lady talked to us because she was British. And she and just then, answered us and we're like, uh oh. They yeah, were like, uh oh. We got caught. But now we have to keep up with it. Yeah, so we couldn't change the accent. We were like, but it was fun, you know. And you, there's like Vegas, Las Vegas is a great place to go. Oh yeah, yeah, it's awesome. I frequently Listen. pretend I'm Canadian. Oh, and oh, I find that, you know, especially if I'm not in this country, I'm somewhere else. I remember someone saying, "Madam is British," and I said, "Oh no, Madam is Canadian," mm. and I, I just you know, masquerade as a Canadian. So I don't have to really change my voice too much because I don't think I could get away with accents, you know. Eh? Okay. Now she's got the you knows. See, she said the you yeah. know, she's going, she's starting to go. She's going Canadian. About. <laughs> About. No, About. But I love it. Well, Canadians have good sense of humor too, you know. Yeah, and they're, they're notoriously nice. Yes. So when I'm pretending to be Canadian, I have to be, pretend to be nice. I like this going to food courts because there's so yeah. many different people, you know, yeah. from all walks of life, you know, and, but malls mm. are kind of changing. Are malls even, you know, well, I don't you think about where you get food courts. It's mostly malls, hospitals. Yes. Yes. You can go to the mm. hospital. That's always interesting. You learn about mm. different diseases and things. And now with masking, you know, I wear my yeah. mask everywhere and it's not that easy to hear people through the right. mask sometimes. So I find myself leaning way over and, you know, and <laughs> once or twice I have had to stop myself from saying, I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Yeah, oh. no, really. <laughs> See, and, uh, <laughs> well, the restaurants are good and farmer's markets because, you know, whenever mm -hmm. people gather around. Ooh, farmer's markets. Yes. Yeah. Because it's like, what you are they can see? About? You can see what they're buying. Mm hmm in the old days, you could uh, eavesdrop very nicely in uh, beauty salons, hair salons. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. But, you know, I don't, obviously don't frequent them as often as I should. But I don't think we've um, been to one in, in I don't years. know. No, after this whole COVID thing, it's like, okay, I yeah. don't know. 
you know, but I, I, you can, but I don't, you know, it's kind of difficult, but, and who cares? <laughs> That's true. It's like, okay, well, I know one day it'll have to happen. Nancy keeps fixing whatever I do to myself, but, um, but it, it's, it, the whole eavesdropping thing is neat too, because you can guess, I mean, even by people's body language, you can guess, are they arguing? Mm -hmm. You just look in people's, you know, when people are driving by, you can see people argue, be upset, be happy. What's mm -hmm. going on? Are they together? Are they related? Um, you know, and go from there. So it, that, the, but the phone thing, I find the phone thing. I mean, That's I went true. to the grocery store today and right, you know, I'm walking to my car and somebody has their GPS on so loud on mm -hmm. their, on their car speaker that I knew which hotel they were going to. And I thought, wow. well, that's really dumb. You know what I mean? That's kind of, yeah. that's kind of asking for, oh, you know, let me go find out what hotel room you're in. I don't know. Mm -hmm. What am I going to do? Actually, maybe it's not that dumb, but to be able to say, tell, let people know where you're going, that's kind of. I once I wrote a story where I'm standing in line behind a woman at the supermarket and she's on the phone mm -hmm. and she's telling her kid at home that she's not going to be home for another couple hours because she's going to the beauty salon and for him to just, uh, you know, get a snack and, and watch TV. And but the person who's listening is not really a nice person. And that person follows her to the beauty salon where it's easy to snatch somebody's purse, snatches her purse, takes the keys out, puts the purse back, goes to her house, steals the child wow and it's called hmm. cell phone call and i believe Good. there's a co copy of it in one of my books in human condition i think i've got a copy of cell phone call in there wow. but uh, she's just too busy and self-absorbed to understand mm -hmm. the danger that she's putting her child in that's amazing you, we were yeah. robbed at gunpoint in new orleans uh, many many oh, years no. ago Mm -hmm. And the guy took my, my bag and I had my keys luckily because I was getting into the car and Nancy, mm -hmm. well, we, we gave him some good language and we'd just come yeah. out of South <laughs> Africa and some, you know, we just, you know, robberies and kidnappings mm -hmm. were pretty prevalent at the time, you know, when, where we were. And so we were very new back into this country and the guy was obviously on crack or something. His eyeballs were kind of like crazy. Yeah, he wasn't all and there. That's we, for sure. He had a gun and no one saw the gun, but it was at my head. Like I could feel it. And that wasn't fun. And then, you know, I'm it. trying to tell everybody and then the gun went around and then I was like, uh oh, but we ended up kind of chasing him, which was dumb. Yeah. But what, but anyway, that's from we were all, where we, were we all used fine. to live. Yeah. And then we're like, what are we doing? He's got a gun. Um, anyway. <laughs> So all of that happens, but we end up having, you know, he had my bag, which had my driver's license in it. And of course he ran all my cards and everything. And that was the thing. He knew where I lived. And so yeah. that, even though we didn't live in new Orleans, we lived in Florida. That was it changed the locks. And it took Change a long everything. time to be comfortable about knowing. And as soon as I could move, I did. Cause it freaked me out that this guy with a gun knew where I lived. Yeah. And it, you know, because of my driver's license. So not that he would drive Maybe. all the way there, but you never know. You, know. you never know. And now people can sell information. Oh, yeah. This was before you know, the internet. So maybe it wouldn't be him, but maybe it would be somebody worse. Yeah. I mean, it's, they get your social security. Ooh, you know, I, I wonder about what people can get off of just your license plate on your car. You know, well, now you can run that. a license plate for free online and find out who the registered owner is. That takes 10 seconds. What and you, you might doing, pay Nancy? 10 to 15 What have bucks. you been doing? I've been researching the people. <laughs> there you go. You make yeah. a good counterintelligence officer. Hey, oh, it's fun. And it's easy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well it is background you know? checks yeah, are is. always important background checks are important whether you're dating or you mm -hmm. know renting or mm -hmm. you know background checks are good or hiring yep. someone just saying mm -hmm. just, just saying. saying background checks are good i used to run background checks myself oh See, wow believe See. me i've run them on you know everybody 
Oh, yeah. this is great. You know, <laughs> well, yeah, my email is, what can you do with that? Well, probably a lot. <laughs> You're okay. I think it's you're interesting. Fine. I ran you both. You're good. Oh, okay, yeah, good, good. good. You know, we are runaways <laughs> from Tucson, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> but I love that you. You know, and, you're welcome back anytime. <laughs> this you. is fun. This is fun. Well, we can't wait to come back. And and for those watching on Zoom, the background is the Catalina Mountains, which we miss hiking right. there. You know, out mm. in that area in the mornings. That would be our view. It was beautiful to live out there and go hiking and wonder if there's any dead bodies in the desert. <laughs> yeah. no, what, if, what if you wrote a book like um, somebody really makes you angry? So you write a book and this is the person that you choose to have murdered in the book. And then you give the book to the person and say, guess which character you are. And you just nice, walk Nancy. away. <laughs> and, you know, and I've never actually written a real person <laughs> as the victim, but I have given the book to people and said, guess which one you are. Oh, Ooh. really? Yeah. And even You're... though it wasn't really based on them at all, you know, people read themselves into characters. Interesting. And, sure. and the more real your characters are, the more people will assume that you based it on them. You know, that's funny. Uh, whether it's the victim or the murderer or the sassy uh, magazine writer. <laughs> See, well, this is interesting because when we lived in Kenya and South Africa, there were different, mm -hmm. uh, there were robberies. And then there was this, this was in South Africa, actually, when we got to South mm -hmm. Africa and somebody had stolen something from some locker at some workplace and they went around and like, <laughs> those who eat the here's the chicken bones and chicken feet or chicken oh yeah yeah the chicken whoever feet. starts to you know get sick mm -hmm. you know you're going to eat these because that at, at that point if you did chicken beak and chicken feet that is to make you feel better if you get sick if you're feeling sick this is it and then there was another one where the shaman or witch doctor over there did like a drink and bread and if you swallow the piece of bread and, and mm -hmm. you start to get um start to choke or feel like you can't swallow the bread then you're guilty you're the you're the and, guilty one. And Nancy, you went through that. You were just on the mm -hmm. sidelines of this. And, oh, it was too and much she fun. started to feel like, oh my gosh, I'm going to choke. Mm -hmm. And it's weird because you can spook yourself out doing these. Well, it, it was really interesting because it's chic, as they called yeah, the he, person with about, all the yeah. turbans and stuff. He just put a bowl of water in front of everybody and he had this purple powder and he mixed it in. And, and he looked into the bowl and he says, okay. I can now tell who's who's the murderer, who's the liar, the, 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 the thief, the, yeah, the thief, yeah. yeah. And so, who's the thief? And and he said, now you should drink the purple water or the water in front of you. And a girl across the table starts choking, and everybody mm -hmm. just looked at her and was like, "You did it! You did it!" <laughs> it <was really laughs> who funny. did it? I'm like, now oh, that's pretty. Meanwhile, I'm like. Now I can't even drink the water because I'm going to choke and I didn't do it. Isn't that Just weird? That it was really an interesting, oh. interesting thing to see how witch doctors really do work. They work pretty much the way we all work, which is we're looking for the tells. Mm -hmm. If you're guilty, if you mm -hmm. feel guilty, mm -hmm. if you're lying, mm -hmm. there, yeah. are, there are physiological tells. And yep. if you can recognize that, and it's pretty much in everybody except real sociopaths. For yeah. a sociopath, you're not going to, you know, you're going to have to find them out the hard way. Because they don't yeah. have like a conscious, really. Like they don't have right. like that guilty right. conscious. Like, I don't think don't they say emotion. like if you're lying in a conversation that you start touching your nose or something like that, there's body language that shows mm -hmm. that you're, you're lying. You're a liar. No. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> That's you another thing. I'm keeping my hands clasped. <laughs> I know. I'm, I'm holding this. Well, I actually have a cat that wants to grab a cord right now, but <laughs> so I'm like trying to hold the cord away. But the um, the one thing too, when you eavesdropping, you can hear when someone's lying. You know. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and then we we go to a lot of bed and breakfasts as we travel, and at the breakfast table, we always look over and go, "Okay, mm -hmm. are you?" really together <laughs> you really married i know <laughs> it's like is that is that who's supposed to be with who you know what i mean because you wonder you know mm -hmm. little affairs and 
how people act is, you know, there's a guilt thing already. You can just, it's weird. You can pick up people's vibes yes. of being guilty. Yeah. This is how, this is how you make good characters though. Yeah. You know, you take all of that information and you make it into a person mm. and that's how your person is going to seem real. Mm. They're going to be nervous sometimes. Uh, they are going to lie once in a while. They are going sure. to going to be embarrassed or be ashamed of something. The, the people who eat, like let's say they are served a, a bowl of fruit or oatmeal. Oatmeal is good because they bend down and they put the spoon in their mouth and then they look up at you like that as they slurp and you're like, yeah, you did it. Oh, yeah. but they're guilty. <laughs> well. <laughs> It's it's weird how we do give it off, but isn't it also villains? What is it about the human species that is who likes the villain? And even as you write, don't you have to have something in there that makes the person like the villain? You know? Yes, yes. And I think sometimes you can make your villains really attractive in many ways, but they'll have that fatal weird flaw. And then in other in other things, I mean. I've written a story, I wrote a story that I'm real fond of um, called It Doesn't Take a Genius. And mm -hmm. it's about a nice middle-aged disappearing woman. You know how you, when you get to your mid fifties, you start disappearing. People start noticing you less and less and put on a few pounds and that, that process is accelerated until finally you're invisible. And it's pretty easy. I think wow. for older women to become invisible. Mm. Um, and when you're invisible, then you have the ability to do things that people would not suspect you of doing. So you can be a really engaging villain. And when you do the murder, it's because that SOP really deserved it. And everybody's cheering you. <laughs> and even though you're technically the villain, Everybody loves you. No, see, but that's about drugs. There's the, the women that uh, bring drugs over the border. And people think, oh, oh yeah, no, yeah. you know, the older women wouldn't be doing drug stuff. Oh, yes, right. they do. Oh, yeah, they do. Don't mess yeah. with them. Mm -mm. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what's so fascinating about female criminals. The mind, the, I mean, the multi, you know, they, they, the organization skills that women have in crime is fascinating mm -hmm. to me. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's always like, oh, she wouldn't do that. I'm like, mm -mm, don't don't mess with women. Women in they crime think are way ahead. Yeah, James Bond, notwithstanding, I think women make the best criminals. I do too. And it's a lot of it has to do with our chameleon-like abilities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We can look glamorous at any age. Look at Helen mm -hmm. Mirren for crying out loud, mm -hmm. or we can look like a homeless person. Look at Helen Mirren for crying out loud. Yeah, I mean, you know, we are chameleons and that chameleon ability can allow us to get away with almost anything. And then she well, smiles. Well, gentlemen, would you like to come to a party with us? I know. <laughs> sure, you can buy us another cocktail. Of course. <laughs> of course. <laughs> yes. You care to walk outside with me? <laughs> See what will happen? Well, you look at Catherine Kelly, you know, everybody looked at Machine Gun Kelly as, you know, the big criminal, but Catherine Kelly was the orchestrator, you know? Oh, those guys were nothing without the malls. Yeah. Those guys were nothing without the women. Exactly. Yeah. Like, you know, when you think about Bonnie and Clyde, it was mm -hmm. Bonnie. She was, but, and yet she also gave, gave things. They were also, you know, really, you know, charitable. So that was interesting too. It's true. It's because we're we're this big dichotomy. I mean, we're chameleons, mm. but we're also we also have this dichotomy of being extremely intelligent, and yet um, sometimes we can just be bowled over by a pretty face. Mm. So well, there's more than one way to do things, and I think yes. women are the chieftains of if this way doesn't work, mm. I'm going to find another easier way. Whereas a man might just bulldoze straight ahead and make it work. On the flip side, there's the women who can get conned by men very easily. We've noticed yes. that. Yes. And it's, it yeah. blows my mind. You'll have an intelligent woman. And just because a guy says, oh, do this and this, they'll buy into it. 
Yeah. Even though deep down they know, like this is a con artist or not maybe even the level of a con artist, but if a male says it. It carries weight in a strange way. It's weird. And I think that's just a social conditioning that many of us have had since birth. Mm. Right. Um, Because, you know, a lot of a lot of mothers would say, just wait till your father gets home. Right. And leave the discipline over to the, the father in the family. It's, now this is going to be big discipline and the mommy does little baby disciplines that <laughs> has to be done. But when you know, those kinds of, of social conditionings, they stay yeah. with you. Yeah. yeah. But do you use that kind of thing when you're writing as well? Uh, those kind of. I, I keep that social conditioning in mind, but uh, for, for my heroines, I want them to overcome it. Mm. I want them to recognize it, to to see what they're doing, to be aware of why they do things. Um, and Kitty takes a chance. She starts out completely social conditioned. Uh, mm. But by the end of the book, she's questioning a lot of that stuff. That's and she's cool. questioning all of the, the men's judgments of her. And mm. she's starting to look at herself in a new light. That's and awesome. starting to realize that she has more self-worth. Um, That's a really good thing to read because I think, you know, there's, oh, this is what we need to be. This is what we need. You know, there's, there's being told, you're told yes, what to do. And yes. that's another part of conditioning where it's, even if it's educational and informative and helpful, and reading oh. it in a book makes you think mm-hmm. as, a, as a, you know, as a reader to go, oh, you know, I wonder how, how I feel. We get to question in our own private little capsule when we're reading. You know, yes. I feel like we have our own little capsule. It's our own experience. Reading is right. truly, and and you know, your own experience. It's so beautiful about mm-hmm. it. It's so personal mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. if you read my book, or if you read my book, Nancy, or if you read my book, Lisa, uh, you'll both take away something different from it, mm-hmm. and it'll be something different from what I thought I was writing. Yeah. Yeah, everybody's own personal experience comes to bear. Yeah. That's why some people really enjoy some books and not so much others. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think you you bring your personal experience into it, and mm-hmm. that's why as a writer, I try to make that personal experience um, unique, mm. but still have a certain amount of universality to it, mm-hmm. so that you can connect. Mm. Even if you're connecting to someone and you're thinking, "Oh, I could never have two boyfriends at one time," or uh, what do you mean? <laughs> you just what? That Tony doesn't mind. It just doesn't Tony last as long. That out. <laughs> it doesn't somehow work out very for a very yeah. long term thing, but you can. I think so. You can. Um, I'm not doing it, but it's yeah. just a lot of work. Yeah, it's way too well, much. Well, you know, work. you have to be organized. <laughs> there we go. It's the orchestration. It's the orchestration and getting and knowing who, what, and where. You know, it, the one thing too I wanted to ask you because you're you're writing novels and then at the same time all these short stories, over a hundred short stories being published, also in yes. different magazines, um, journals. Writing a short story, I would think is harder than writing a novel because you, you, you know what I mean? It's, it, mm. but then you get to a novel, isn't it? Would you think like a chapter is almost like writing a short story, but you're continuing it on, you know what I mean? It's like, I don't know. It just seems to me that it's, it's, they're connected, but really hard to, it's like, it's, not it's, the good, same. it's not the same, they're... but it's good work to do before you write a novel so that you keep your novel well, when I was writing short stories, um, mostly I know I wrote a lot of science fiction when I was writing oh, short cool. stories. I wrote a lot of uh, mysteries, but mostly I wrote science fiction. Hmm. And uh, I had several magazines that were um, that were willing to take my stories all the time. I mean, they I had a following of sorts hmm. in those days. I'm pretty sure it was 14 year old boys, but. Um, and then when email <laughs> became popular, I had to stop emailing. Was this back in the people. day of Barbarella? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no. Not quite back that far, but yeah. yeah kind no, of no, no. And I had a, I had a great, uh, I had a great character that I wrote about all the time. She was a, uh, a pirate. Oh, she cool. pilot, piloted a, 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 a rust bucket that, you know, sailed between planets and, uh, she ran 
uh, contraband cargo, and she had a big, good-looking and extremely dumb co-pilot that uh, was always getting into trouble. So I wrote a whole series of those stories, and um, I had quite a following for those. And I, I wrote a, a lot of uh, science fiction with cats because I liked having, I like the idea of cats being a lot more sentient than we give them credit for. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, you know, they're they're not a they're not dogs by any means. They no, are they a different are, they, are they, they they could be criminals. You know, if you're they could a be. criminal, they yeah, they would be the ones orchestrating the crime. Absolutely. They, they could be Supreme Court justices because they sit and look oh, yeah. and, and they pass judgment just by looking at you. They do. They do. They, they look judgmental. at you and you know, oh, okay, I probably shouldn't have done that. You know, they look at you, yeah, that, and it's like, oh, you want to be fed now, do you? Yeah, it's like you're two seconds late. They're like that, where dogs are just high and happy. You do, do, do. Yeah, dogs have no other purpose but to love you. I mean, dogs are just love, but yeah. cats are a little different. So yeah, I was writing all of these short stories, and it is very difficult to write a short story especially if you, you have to follow submission guidelines if you want to be published. So um, many of them have a, a length and uh, certain things that they'll accept, certain things they won't. So writing short stories is a real exercise in, in conforming your original thought to what the editor really wants. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a really good exercise in writing concisely. So I, I had this idea back in the late 90s that I wanted to write a novel. And that's where I first got the idea for Tony, okay. my character. And I started writing long. But the problem was, like you mentioned, I'd get to the end of a chapter and think I was done. Um, mm. And I realized that I needed a much longer story arc. Mm. With a short story, you've got pretty much one idea two or three characters, two or three settings, and you must have a satisfying ending. With a novel, uh, you have a much bigger arc. Uh, you have to step mm. back much further from what's going on mm. so that your characters are developed, so that you have more than one or two settings. Um, because mm. we're not all Kafka, we're not going to wake up, you know, turning into bugs. So I'm thinking that writing a novel for me was much more uh, difficult. So I put it away and I didn't start working again on the novels until last year. Oh, wow. When, like everybody, I had a lot of time on my hands, nothing to do. And I found that I was unable to write short stories. I started three or four and I was even under contract for one and had a hard time uh, finishing it, had a hard time making it small, mm -hmm. I kept wanting to back up and make mm -hmm. a larger arc. So I had the idea for the character of Tony. And I actually just sat down and wrote the first book, and then the second book and half of the third book, before I ran out of steam. Wow. And then I just put them away. And I started working on Kitty. And I wrote the, the first Kitty book and half of the second Kitty book. And I just put them away. And then I went back and looked at Buzzkill. And I thought, you know, I've really got something here that could work, but it really needs a good editor. Mm. And I cannot stress the importance of a good editor. Oh, you, oh, you yeah. hit Nancy's favorite thing. She is, <laughs> yes. It is vital. Mm. So I got myself a good editor. And she is fabulous mm, awesome. and it took her uh about three months to edit buzzkill and then it came back to me and i gave it another run through and then sent it back to her and she gave it another run through and we did this about five times um oh. and then then we sent it to a friend and said would you proof it for typos because that's not what we were looking for and so i got it back with i think there are i think there might be two typos in it that we missed. 
So of course, you know, and that's not too bad because no. almost every book, even out of large publishing houses, will have at least one or two typos now. Absolutely. No matter so, what we do, you know, with even with the yeah. magazines, you know, yeah. some of our magazines were verging on two hundred word, uh, two hundred pages, and you know, it was like okay, and, and you proofread, proofread, proofread. Mm -hmm. As soon as you hit the publish button, you're like, oopsie, oopsie. look, exactly. and, yes. and it will be something yes. so stupid. Uh, you know, I remember one, uh, we said, like, even just the, it was like the, I can't, it was just a classic one. We said bids instead of birds. And it was like the major title or something. I can't, it was just really dumb. And it was, and we, it was right in front of us. And we have a friend who's really not good at spelling or writing, you know, and she's looking at the magazine. She says, you said this. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> it's like, well, you know, it just happens. And I don't think any publication, I don't think it's it. But what we have found is that people correct things as they're reading. Yes. In their mind. In their Your mind. mind. Your mind yeah. does it. Yes. You know, so it's it's just we're not humans are not perfect. And that's the what first, makes good stories. Are you sure? <laughs> I know I'm not. I'm just going to say that. Copy. The first proof copy I got from Kitty's Take, Takes a Chance had my name spelled wrong on the cover, and I had not noticed it. That's probably wow. I did it then. Just blame me. If there's typos. And then the weird thing is, is once you make one typo, it, it'll happen. It'll just happen over again and, over. and again. And yeah. We, yeah. I don't know what yeah. it is. Uh, well, I know for me, like, you, you know, we'll put up a radio episode if I make one typo wrong, and then no matter what I do, I'll do it again somewhere else, and then I'll do it again. So... Mm -hmm. Everybody watch, <laughs> watch for Kate's episode coming out. Don't be a typo there. No, I'm kidding. I'm, I'm perfect now. Just kidding. But yeah. I, this... seem to, I seem to spell the word pushed with a W. Really? Yes. And I have to actually do search and replace on that word. I don't know why. Maybe it's because I type one handed. I don't know. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, huh? Yeah. yeah I'm, I'm paralyzed on the left side. So I do all my typing with just the one. Hand. Oh, wow. That's mm -hmm. wow. Does that do you get really, really fast on, you know, yeah, the one pretty hand? Fast. Yeah. 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 Wow. Wow. Because mm -hmm. that's well, yeah. And I've taught myself how to type. And so it's backwards. And so there's times mm -hmm. where everything becomes <laughs> dyslexic. So it, it's true. Maybe it's the wine. Mm -hmm. Maybe wine. it's the wine. I hadn't thought of that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So it is, whenever wine. you see my typos, everyone blame the wine. If that's <laughs> true. Don't blame the wine drinker. No. Mm -hmm. No. Yeah. Don't blame the drinker. Oh wow. Well. Maybe you should just develop a wine called misspelled. Yeah. Really. That'd be cool. Typo with a splat. Yeah. You know, or a splash. <laughs> I should say a splash. You know. Yeah. Oh. May I give a shout out to my editor? Oh, please sure. do. Um, please do. It's, it's Maggie Beth Reese Razor in Phoenix. And as far as I know, I'm, I'm her um, only troublesome client, oh. um, <laughs> but she is wonderful. And I, I call her out in the books as the editor extraordinaire and defender of the Oxford comma. Oh, oh my gosh, not the commas. Oh, oh. Yes. oh boy, oh boy. Yes. I have to use it. I have to use it so I have to be consistent. And right. I have to use it to make my meaning clear. Mm -hmm. so, you have to have the comments it's that just, relationship yeah. between the writer and the editor is very fascinating you know the back yes. and forth and it's like no this needs to be chopped no it doesn't kill the baby yes it's going down it <laughs> needs to go down sorry <laughs> you know I love what you're saying though about getting an editor mm -hmm. because there are things that yes. I think we can get too close in what we're creating you know yes. and, and a good editor can go okay you're veering off here this will help here you know, and, and yes, there's grammar too involved. <laughs> there's grammar in there. But I think you're really right on that. Uh, lastly, I did want to ask, because I start off talking about the Festival of Books, the Tucson Festival of Books. That's coming back next year, right? Do you know? That is coming back. I understand it's coming back in person next year. Awesome. Uh, Tucson Sisters in Crime um, always has a booth. Uh, our Phoenix sister chapter the Desert Sleuths usually have a booth near us. So if you don't get one sister in crime, you'll get another one. Mm -hmm. And uh, the MWA, Mystery Writers of America, always has a booth uh, not too far from us as well. And I belong to all of them. So um, yeah. I urge everybody who has a chance to come to the festival, by all means, show up. Mm -hmm. um, and here's, here's something that... Um, 
not everybody knows, but uh, the Tucson chapter of Sisters in Crime will be hosting Left Coast Crime, the big conference, not uh, not next year, but the following year. Wonderful. So we are Wonderful. scheduled to have Left Coast Crime in Tucson, and there will be more uh, available on that at the Left Coast Crime website. Excellent, excellent. And everyone for Tucson Sisters in Crime, go to TucsonSistersInCrime.org and keep up with Kate, go to KateThornton.net and Kate, you're on social media as well on Facebook, right? That's right. And you're on Amazon. Go to Amazon. I'm on Amazon. Get, yes. yes. Go get her books there. Uh, again, KateThornton.net uh, is the website. So thank you so much for joining Thanks. us, Kate. Thank you for having me. So it's much fun. fun. Oh, and everyone keep up with us at bigblendradio.com. Our shows air Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Pacific time, 7 p.m. Eastern time.